Hello and welcome back to the Medication Nation. As always, it's your boy Tomorrow's Medic and we're back with another absolute banger of a video. Now, today's video is going to be a bit different. I'll be walking you through what a typical table-based learning session looks like at the MBBS Imperial Curriculum. Now, in recent years, we've got the introduction of a new curriculum. It's called the Spiral Curriculum. And essentially what that means is you have a movement towards um, a more active approach towards learning as opposed to your classical traditional passive learning that you get from sort of lecture based learning so we've got to move away from the lectures to a more sort of team based environmental active approach to learning where you're actively using the knowledge that you're being taught and this is where table based learning really comes into its own it is something a bit different so hopefully you know comment down below if you did like videos like this so remember like subscribe and enjoy the video Meet Ashish. Ashish is a 52-year-old obese gentleman originally from India. He presents to the GP complaining of constantly having to get up in the middle of the night to go to the toilet and is therefore always tired. The GP subsequently diagnoses Ashish with type 2 diabetes. Ashish previously had a myocardial infarction in 2015, however is currently otherwise fit and well and on no medications. Diabetes is chronic hyperglycemia that can cause long-term damage to specific tissues, notably the retina, the arteries, the nerves, and the kidneys. There are two types of diabetes, with type 1 being due to autoimmune destruction of the cells that release insulin. However, this type is far less common, only affecting around 10% of all patients with diabetes and also tends to present at an earlier age. As type 2 is the type Ashish has, we'll be looking into this type more in detail. So diabetes currently affects a whopping 7% of the entire UK population. It's estimated that 1 million people in the UK currently live with diabetes undiagnosed and by 2030, 5.5 million people in the UK will have diabetes. Moreover, diabetes is extremely expensive. Around 10% of NHS's annual budget is spent on treating diabetes alone. So usually when your blood sugar levels rise, this is detected by pancreatic beta cells which release insulin. However, type 2 diabetes is characterized by progressive insulin resistance. A number of factors can influence this insulin resistance, including your ethnicity, particularly if you're Afro-Caribbean or South Asian, obesity, genetics, and increasing age. Insulin resistance leads to increased hepatic glucose output, but also you have reduced uptake of glucose by the peripheral tissues. The net effect is you have increased circulating blood glucose levels. As a result, your pancreas initially tries to compensate by secreting higher amounts of insulin. However, eventually the pancreas becomes exhausted, you get gradual beta cell failure, which leads to hyperglycemia. So the GP diagnosed Ashish using HbA1c. HbA1c refers to glycated hemoglobin, and it's a marker of glucose control over the past three months. The more glucose that is present in the blood, the more the hemoglobin is glycosylated, and so the higher the HbA1c and a HbA1c of greater than 6.5% is diagnostic for diabetes. However, it's always good clinical practice to take two readings to confirm the diagnosis. Evidence for this cutoff points come from numerous studies, for instance, the DTEC2 analysis, which showed that beyond the HbA1c of 6.5%, the prevalence of diabetes-specific retinopathy significantly increases. So how did Ashish feel at the diagnosis? Well, he was confused, he was overwhelmed, he was in disbelief, and he was depressed. However, these feelings aren't unique to Ashish. Around two thirds of patients don't fully understand their diagnosis, and you are twice as likely to be depressed if you have diabetes than if you do not. The GP prescribed Ashish with metformin alongside lifestyle intervention, including weight loss, diet restriction, and exercise. However, these measures were unable to control his blood sugar levels, as at a recent appointment, his HbA1c was measured at 8%. This being beyond the 7% threshold NICE recommends for intensification of drug treatment. So now dual therapy with metformin and either one of these four drug classes is now indicated. Let's look at the mechanism of action of some of these drugs. So metformin increases insulin sensitivity. It's a big guanide. It also reduces the rate of absorption of glucose through the gastrointestinal system. Some side effects include GI side effects and lactic acidosis. 
Sulfonyl ureas block the ATP sensitive potassium channel, leading to greater insulin being released. Side effects include hypoglycemia. Thiazoldiones bind to the PPAR gamma nuclear receptor, which modulates the transcription of several genes, ultimately leading to a more favorable glycemic and lipid profile. Side effects include weight gain, fluid retention, hepatotoxicity, and heart failure in some. GLP-1 is a hormone released by L cells in the gut due to the presence of food, and it's shown to increase insulin secretion and inhibit glucagon secretion, resulting in reduced blood glucose levels. DDP-4 is an enzyme that breaks down GLP-1, so DDP-4 inhibitors are going to promote the length of time in which GLP-1 can have its effects. The main side effect of GLP-1 is weight loss. Finally, SGLT-2 inhibitors inhibit the reabsorption of glucose through the proximal convoluted tubule, which results in greater glucose being excreted through the urine. So which drug is best? Well, a network meta-analysis which aimed to assess the efficacy and safety of different oral anti-glycemic agents in adults with inadequately controlled type 2 diabetes mellitus or metformin alone by Elizabeth and colleagues included 62 different randomized control trials that compared anti-diabetic medications to either other therapies or placebo and patients were treated for a minimum of 12 weeks. The meta-analysis showed that all therapies significantly reduced HbA1c, however sulfonyl ureas reduced HbA1c the most, followed by GLP-1 agonists. Body weight was significantly increased by sulfonyl ureas and thiazoldiones, however GLP-1 agonists and SGLC2 inhibitors were shown to significantly reduce both body weight and systolic blood pressure. The major adverse effects recorded was hypoglycemia in the sulfonyl urea group. The study does have a few limitations. Firstly, as the network meta-analysis compared 25 different therapies plus placebo on six separate endpoints, multiple hypothesis testing increases the risk of type 1 error. Furthermore, safety evaluation is limited due to the short follow-up periods of the trials included and also limited safety data by these trials. So the effects of these medications on important specific endpoints such as cardiovascular events, pancreatitis, renal dysfunction and heart failure could not be assessed. So although sulfonyl ureas were shown to be the most effective in reducing HbA1c and are also the cheapest drug class out of all of them, it's probably not appropriate for Ashish. This is because the study showed it significantly increased the risk of severe hypoglycemia, which studies show can reduce patient quality of life, but furthermore is implicated in the development of arrhythmias and cardiac ischemia, which is going to increase the cardiovascular risk, which in a patient like Ashish who already has a high cardiovascular risk due to a previous myocardial infarction, probably should be avoided. Furthermore, sulfonyl ureas are associated with weight gain, not only does this further increase the cardiovascular risk, however it is also shown to worsen insulin resistance. GLP-1 and SGLT-2 inhibitors on the other hand were shown to significantly reduce body weight which study shows improved glycemic control and reduces insulin resistance and cardiovascular risk. The cardiovascular risk is further reduced due to the significant reductions in systolic blood pressure by these drug classes. So a search of the wider literature in patients specifically with suboptimally controlled type 2 diabetes on metformin alone with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease showed that these drugs can significantly reduce the cardiovascular risk and also reduce all-cause mortality and therefore these drugs are probably the best ones for Ashish to be taking. So which one should we choose? The GP wanted to understand what Ashish's thoughts were. Ashish said that he's extremely scared of needles and that they give him a lot of stress and anxiety. He also said he finds pills a lot easier to take and he's more likely to take a pill than an injection. The GP therefore decided to prescribe Ashish an SGLT2 inhibitor. Not only does the evidence base show that it's effective in reducing HbA1c, however these drugs are shown to reduce cardiovascular risk which because of the past medical history of a myocardial infarction is very important and also by talking to Ashish and finding that he's not a fan of injections there's going to be greater patient compliance with SGLT2 inhibitors which are a pill 
rather than GLP-1 agonists which have to be injected and therefore the increased likelihood of patient compliance probably outweighs the slightly more effectiveness of GLP-1 agonists. So in summary, the NICE guidance doesn't favour one particular therapy for second line intervention when blood sugar levels are inadequately controlled by metformin and lifestyle intervention. This is because all the drugs are shown to be effective in lowering blood glucose. Instead, therapy choice should be individualised to the patient, taking into account a number of factors such as safety, efficacy, comorbidities and patient preference. SGLT2 and GLP-1 agonists are particularly useful in patients like Ashish who have increased cardiovascular risk due to their effects in lowering weight and systolic blood pressure, as well as wider evidence showing a reduced cardiovascular risk in these patients and a reduction in all-cause mortality.